Hey everybody, today's video is called The Burden Against Egypt. And today we continue our pass through study here in our study through the book of Isaiah this summer. And we are in chapter 19 where we're looking against the burden of Egypt. So from chapter 19 into the next chapter, verse 6, we're going to look at the oracle of judgment concerning Egypt. And in contrast to chapter 20, the language that we're going to see in today's chapter, we should not view it as historic, but symbolic. And in so chapter 19, verse 1 through 4, says the burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence and the heart of Egypt will melt in its mist. I will set the Egyptians against Egyptians. Everyone will fight against his brother and everyone against his neighbor. City against city, kingdom against kingdom. The spirit of Egypt will fail in its midst. I will destroy their council and they will consult the idols and the charmers, the mediums and the sorcerers. And the Egyptians I will give into the hand of a cruel master. And a fierce king will rule over them, says the Lord the Lord of hosts. So the clouds, they are the vehicles of for the Lord's coming to execute judgment as seen elsewhere in the scriptures, such as Psalm 18, verse 10 and 11, Psalm 104, verse 3, and Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And as I mentioned before, if you are interested in doing a more in-depth study through the book of Daniel, uh, from the premillennial viewpoint, my friend Brian Peckham is doing a current study on Monday and Tuesdays on his page throughout the book of Daniel. And he'll be actually working on chapter 7, I believe, coming up uh, on Monday. And so the Lord riding on a swift cloud is an ancient Near East image of deity. And the Exodus represented the Lord's earlier victory over the gods of Egypt in Exodus 12.12. 12. And Egypt was noted for its internal strife through the centuries and the nations will experience even worse under God's judgment. And they spent much of the 8th century BC in civil war. And we see an internal strife will lead to disorient, disorientation and depression. And with nowhere else to turn, the Egyptians go on to consult spiritualists or like mediums, people that think they have contact with the dead world. And the Israelites of Isaiah's day did the same as we saw back in Isaiah chapter 8 verse 19. And Egypt was subject to foreign rule, beginning with the Assyrian conquests of the middle of the 7th century BC. And the disunity and inter internal strife was because of the idolatry to spell the ends of Egypt's greatness. And we see that God would knock over their many different gods. And in the days of Exodus, God made all the idols of Egypt to totter at his presence. And here... We see Isaiah tells the Lord would do it again. And when nations are under the judgment of God, it, it seems often that God removes sound counsel and wisdom from their leaders and the people turn to the vain pagan things for wisdom instead. And I always argue when you want to look at foolish leadership and a foolish nation, look at just our own with our president, right? We, we, have, we don't have wise counsel leading us in our nation today. They don't have wisdom. And they turn to the vegan, pagan things. They worship the god of Molech and abortion, all that type of stuff. And to carry on here, God may judge a nation by removing competent leadership and giving them cruel and oppressive rulers. You know, just look at how the president, when he took over, how he dealt with COVID-19 and forced, forced vaccinations telling employers to fire people if they don't take a shot. And this is a curse and judgment to any people. In verse 5 through 10 says, 
the waters will, fit, will fail from the sea, and the river will be wasted and dried up. The rivers will turn foul. The brooks of defense will be emptied and dried up. The reeds and rushes will wither. The papyrus reeds by the river, by the mouth of the river, and everything sown by the river will wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishermen will also mourn, and those who lament, who cast hooks into the river, and they will languish, who spread nets on the waters. Moreover, those who work and find flax, and those who weave fine fabric will be ashamed, and its foundations will be broken. All who make wages will be troubled of soul. So we see in verses 5 through 10, there's a disruption of the Nile River that, ca that causes wreck havoc on Egypt. And God will act to take away the country's only water source, the Nile, and its tributaries. And it will become as an economic disaster as they depend greatly on their economy through the Nile River. And we see in Exodus, or no, Ezekiel 30, verse 2, that the Lord can easily dry up the Nile. And it was also a direct assault on Pharaoh's claim as a god to regulate the flow of the Nile. And the deposits left by the flooding of the Nile yielded rich agricultural crops, permitting Egypt to export grain to the rest of the world. And goodbye to that. And the, lo the loss of the Nile's important fishing business through verse 8 would mean a great loss to the population of Egypt. And Egypt in the ancient world was famous for its production of linen from the flax. So both the growth of the plant and the manufacturer of the cloth depended on the water of the Nile. And fishing and flax products made ancient Egypt famous, as I mentioned, and God was to remove the pillars on which the working class depended upon. And the word refers either generally to the economic structure of a society or specifically the upper class, which organized businesses of the land. So we see in verses 5 through 10, in a nutshell, that all aspects of society would suffer under the judgment upon Egypt greatly. In verse 11 through 15 says, Surely the princes of Zoan are fools, and Pharaoh's wise counselors give foolish counsel. How do you say to Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of the ancient kings? Where are they? Where are your wise men? Let them tell you now, and let them know what the Lord of hosts has purposed against Egypt. The princes of Zoan have become fools. The princes of Noph are deceived. They are also deluded Egypt. The princes of Noph are deceived. They have also deluded Egypt, those who are the mainstay of its tribes. The Lord has mangled a perverse spirit in her midst, and they have caused Egypt to err in all her work. As a drunken man staggers in his vomit, neither will there be any work for Egypt which the head or tail, palm branch or bulrush may do. So Zoan was also known as Tanis and was Egypt's capital of this time. And God turns the wisdom of the wise into folly, saying, I am the son of the wise. And we see that as a sarcastic remark taunting Egypt's claim to wisdom from 1 Kings 4, verse 29 through 31. And Zoan was in northern Egypt, east of the Nile, in Dela, in the Dela region. And Egypt's experts were helpless to deal with the crisis because they were ignorant of the Lord's judgment against the land. And Noph, we see in verse 13, it's another name for Memphis. And when I say Memphis, I'm not talking about Memphis, Tennessee, because nothing good ever comes out of Memphis there in the United States. But it's the capital of northern Egypt at one time. And the city had leaders who were in a state of confusion regarding a true respective perspective of Egypt's crisis. And if the cornerstone of a society suffers, 
from delusion. They can do nothing else than delude the people that they are leading. And this includes political, economic, and religious leaders. And we see that the Lord has caused like a dizziness that resulted in a complete loss of productivity when the invaders came. And judgment often in the Old Testament is compared to drunkenness. We see that used later on in Isaiah 51 verse 21 through 23 and Jeremiah 25 verse 15 through 16. And if you have any exposure to a drunk, someone who staggers, you know, maybe they're, you know, before the hangover phase, they might fall and have trouble getting back up. When I was a MP years ago and stationed in Hawaii, we had a part of off base in the Waikiki district that the army owns. And we used to do patrols through the parks and all that on nighttime and we would see you know every weekend alcohol is a major part of the military culture you know and there was like two guys that were people were concerned about because they were staggering all over the place they kept falling over you know they were able to get back up but not everybody can easily and so these two guys are just like falling over dropping their phone like every couple seconds so on so forth Judgment will extend from the civil and religious leaders down to the bottom of society. And true wisdom is not knowing all kinds of facts, plans, or strategies. It is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding as we find in Proverbs 9 verse 10. So keep that in mind. True wisdom is not knowing all kinds of facts, plans, or strategies. It is having the fear of the Lord and knowledge of the Holy One. In uh, verse 16, 17, it says, In that day Egypt will be like woman and will be afraid and fear because of the waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he waves over it. And the land of Judah will be a terror to Egypt. Everyone who makes mention of it will be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he has determined against it. So, turning from Egypt's destitution, just described in the first verses, the prophet proceeds to describe, describe Egypt's eventual turn into the true God in that day in verse 16. And for premillennialists, they believe that this is referring to the future millennial reign of Christ after a seven-year tribulation period for 1,000 years. And God's judgment will immobilize mighty Egypt to the point of that the nations realizes its defensive li defensiveness and hopelessness. In verse 17, instead of Judah fearing Egypt, Egypt would fear Judah. So God's great power on behalf of Israel will cause this to happen in Exodus 10.7 and Exodus 12.33. Uh, covers and such will occur at Christ's second coming and all the Lord needs to do is wave his hand and the people of Egypt will respond in terror in verse 18 through 22 says in that day five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of canon and swear by the Lord of hosts one will turn one will be called the city of destruction and that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar to the Lord at its border. And it will be a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord because of their oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a mighty one, and he will deliver them. Then the Lord will be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day, and will make sacrifice and offering. Yes, they will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. And the Lord will strike Egypt, he will strike and heal it. They will return to the Lord and he will be entreated by them and heal them. So not just one, not just one, but five cities will turn to the Lord. 
And Egypt is to speak the language of Judah and convert to Judah's form of worship, converting to the Lord in a dramatic way. And this prophecy anticipates the personal reign of the Davidic king on earth. And the city of destruction in verse 18 is likely the sun, the city of the sun, Heliopolis, which is the home of the Egyptian sun god. Verse 19 speaks figuratively of Egypt's conversion to the Lord in that day of Messiah's reign on earth. In verse 20, God is to act on behalf of Egypt as he did earlier in delivering Israel, as seen in Judges 2.18, Judges 3.9, Judges 3.15, Judges 6, verse 7 through 9, and Judges chapter 10, verse 11 and 12. And the altar it signifies their commitment to the Lord, the pillar memorial commemorating God's great work. And as in the day of the judges, God will be a savior and defender of his people from oppressors. And the future kingdom will be a time when everyone will know the Lord because the new covenant will dominate. And in verse 22, the strike and heal is when a parent disciplines, as when a parent disciplines a child for purpose of betterment so that the Lord had dealt and would deal with Egypt as also seen in Hosea chapter 6 verse 1. And the divine discipline of God will draw the Egyptians to the Lord. And if God can do these things for the Egyptians, how much more will he do for his own people? And know this, that this prophecy had a near, for, a near fulfillment in the 4th century as recorded by theologian Athanasius as he wrote from Egyptian on large conversion of Egyptians from their false worship to the Lord. And for the far fulfillment in the premillennial belief, sacrifices are allowed during the millennium as a memorial of Jesus' great work, but never intended for atonement purposes. So it's just as an act of like ceremony. In verse 23 through 25, it says, In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian will come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. In that day Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands in Israel my inheritance. So the two great warnings wherein nations of Isaiah's time are to reach a lasting peace with one another during that day of Christ's reign. And Israel in that day will become what God intended her to be, a blessing to the rest of the world, as called for in Genesis 12, 3, Genesis 42, verse 6. And we see that Isaiah, uh, Israel, Egypt, and Assyria would be joined in a patriarchal promises. In verse 25, my people, the work of my hands elsewhere in scripture speaks only to Israel as seen across Isaiah, Psalm 100 verse 3, Psalm 138 verse 8, Jeremiah 11 4, Hosea 1 verse 10, and Hosea 2 verse 23. And in the future kingdom, Israel is to be God's instrument for the drawing of other nations into his fold. And I see these verses, ultimately, I see God's amazing work of redemption. And God's salvation extends to the nations, and he will call forth his elect from Egypt and Assyria, not just from Israel. And I wonder what Jonah thought as he seemed to have like this kind of hatred and appearance toward Assyria. And note the following on conversions from this passage. So we can learn about conversion con conversions through today's chapter. And one point is God's grace often comes to the very worst of men. Number two, God sends a savior by his grace. And number three, God 
grace changes us in our language. And so to wrap up our study for today, we look tonight at the strike in, the God strike in Egypt with burden. And we see that God gave them over to themselves through civil war and submission to a cruel master. And verse 5 through 10 shows us the Lord strikes Egypt by drying up the Nile, therefore reckoning their economy because the Nile was their one main water source in the nation. And verse 11 through 15 shows us that the Lord strikes Egypt by sending them foolish counsel. And I want to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 20 it says, where, are, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So the words, where then are your wise men in Isaiah 19, 12 addressed to Pharaoh, we see it was continued to stand as a hostile attack against human pride. And verse 16 and 17 of Isaiah 19 today showed us that when God strikes Egypt, there will be terror among the people. Kind of, you know, makes sense. In verse 18 through 22, we see that God saves Egypt as Egypt turns to him. And we see that the chapter ends with an amazing peace between three hostile former enemies. And we often hear Israel is God's inheritance. Have you heard that before? But we ought to know that Israel is not the only inheritance of God. And I want to go over to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Ephesians 1, 18 says, we'll bump it up a little bit to verse 15. It says, therefore, I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your life for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come so specifically, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and who? In the saints. So notice in verse 18, the Apostle Paul says that those in Christ, the saints, are his riches, inheritance, and glory. So for us who have called on Christ to save us, to, you know, be our Savior, we are His inheritance. So we'll see you next, this upcoming week, as we're going to be looking at not trusting in Egypt as we continue looking at Egypt uh, coming up either probably Monday or Tuesday. I'll get back to you on the confirmed timing. So I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. God bless.